This is the recap of chapter two of Ta-da! How to Lose a Planet, the Afro Future Epic. Um, okay, so each recap kind of consists of something true that inspired the fiction, real moments that inspired, inspired the fake moments, and some kind of storytelling tip. Um, so the real things, let's see. Uh, so one scene that happens in chapter two is you see the first time Kylo has a brainstorm, which are these really intense just moments where his internal world, his imagination overcomes his external world. And that's part, uh, partly tied into the story of How to Lose a Planet as far as just publishing it in the sense that it's just kind of a story that's enveloped my life. It's been stuck in my heart for years. And even when I was getting rejection after rejection, I mean literally hundreds of rejections from agents, I just kept working on it. And it got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm just going to put it out in the world because it's such a big thing. It's just such a big piece of my interior world that's been just taking over my exterior, exterior world that I have to get off my shelf before I can write my next book or do my next project. And it was funny, I was talking to an ex-classmate just this week and he said, you know, you only get one first book. You know, it should probably look like the way you want it to look like. And even at the end where the last round of rejections for agents was basically people saying, I really like the book, I just can't sell it. And it's like a climate thing or an industry thing. It's not the, the quality of the work. It's like, all right, cool, I'm just gonna do it myself. Uh, so the brainstorms is kind of a parallel, just kind of like having something inside of you so big and so powerful, it just takes over your external world. You know, like I could be out clubbing right now, but I'm working on this. Um, something else. Oh, Kato. Kato is a Ugandan name. Funny thing about Ugandan names, a lot of them, not a lot of them, but some of them look really Japanese. I was asking my mom about that. She said they do, but she doesn't know why. Uh, pronounced differently, like this one would typically be called Kato, but it's Kato. It means um, the second twin. And I just chose that because I'm half Ugandan and it sounded cool. Uh, hmm. There's something else I want to talk about. Oh, right. There's a scene where Kato doesn't trust Lacey. And part of it is because he doesn't trust the press. And the reason he doesn't trust the press is because before he went to jail, there was a news report that said that he used to be a gangster or in the future a ganger. And that was part of the reason that motivated him not to kill while in the army. I live in Boston. Boston's WCVB News did that story about me, and they said that I was a gangster, which was thoroughly offensive to me, my friends, my family, but also just funny, because honestly, like considering the crew I grew up with, I was the geek, I was a nerd, I was the bookworm, nobody who knows me would even say maybe, you know, so I kind of felt like the real insult was, there's no way they talked to anybody who knew me, and somebody said I was a gangster, it just was never, ever in the realm of possibility. Uh, but that's a true story, WCVB News, I still remember, even though it was 15 years ago, they did that foul last story about me. Um, cultural stagnancy. That's like this little moment in the story where Kato's talking about um, this essay, cultural stagnancy, and how like society has advanced technologically and they can terraform wounds, but we still have these social ills. And I put that in because this chapter used to be the first chapter, and so it got workshopped in a class. And <laughs> my classmates, mostly white people, uh, their main critique was, yeah, but we, but will we still have prisons in the future? Will we, will we still have racism in the future? And I was like, you fucking idiots. I'm sorry, that's really what I thought. Um, you think people 100 years ago were saying that you think we'll still have racism in the 21st century? I think the black people were, because they know what it is. But, uh, and a bunch of white people too, sure, sure. But anyway, cultural stagnancy is just my way of saying, just kind of answering that quirky response to the story. Like, yeah, people can still advance technologically and still have these same social problems that just never really get addressed head on. And I think that's it. Hmm. Oh, right. One last thing. Not an angel. When uh, Lacey asks him, you beat up two people in prison, but you refuse to fight in the war. And he said, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make me an angel. And I always felt like that was part of my experience, like refusing to kill while I was in the army. Like, I would have stayed in the army. I actually liked the army. Um, there were really a lot of high points. So I applied for my conscientious objector status. And not only did they get rejected, they actually got buried, which apparently was illegal. Um, my captain, whose name I also know, remember, um, he just refused to process the form, which led to a whole lot of rebellious stuff for me, but that's actually not allowed. So somebody else, it was funny, like during my court martial, when leading up to it, this other guy, he knew about it. Like, I didn't even know. He said, no, I, I remember I was there when he said it to the entire truth. Like, nobody will have the conscious objector uh, form processed. And I was like, yo, my lawyer is someone that's legal. That guy volunteered to testify on my behalf at the court-martial because he was so certain that's what happened. So, but anyway, I only said it because, like, 
I don't know. I didn't like me refusing to kill. It wasn't so much about me being an angel. It's just that they lied to me and it pissed me off. And this is like, there's only so much a person can take. Like I was reading this GQ magazine at the time and there's this guy who was in Iraq. He was saying, you know, he guessed that recruiters are essentially salespeople and they got to sell you on an idea. But you do that when you're trying to sell a toaster, not when somebody's putting their life on the line. And he was saying that from his perspective because he felt like his military experience was not what his recruiter told him about. And so, I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know. Like, I'm not an angel. I just I just got sick of being lied to and pushed around. And I said, no, enough's enough. Funny story. has nothing to do with anything from this chapter. Well, another one of the captain I had, because when I was telling people about why I'm not going to Iraq and why I got lied to, everybody had their own stories about, like, shady stuff recruiters did. And so one captain, he was telling me about how he went to recruit with his nephew, right? But he didn't tell the recruiter he was a captain in the army. He just went as his nephew's uncle, let the recruiter tell his nephew the story. And he tells me, five minutes in, I said, we gotta go, he's lying to you. And he, wouldn't even, he didn't explain the recruiter anything. He didn't explain to the recruiter that he's in the army, that he's a captain. He said, he's lying to you. He, he's selling you an absolute false story. We gotta go. Like, no, we're not working with this guy. Uh, which I just found interesting. That just popped in my head. So the storytelling tip. Uh, I talked about it in the first recap about how like coming up with a splashy opening because my professors were telling me how like agents get so many submissions and so many queries, like literally like 10,000 a year that they're just looking for a reason to reject your story, even if it's good because they have so much other work to get through. So I started with a splashy opening. By splashy opening, what I meant, and probably should have said the first time, but just forgot, is the inciting incident. So typically with the story structure, you start out with the ordinary world. I'm gonna use Star Wars, I know it's kind of old, it's a 40 year old movie, but it's just the one I know like the back of my head. Luke Skywalker is a farm boy with his aunt and uncle. That is his ordinary world, and you get introduced to that, to that until the inciting incident. His aunt and uncle get murdered, and now he gets to fly in space and fight the Empire. And so, what I did was kind of the inciting incident before the ordinary world, only you got tips, you got bits and pieces of the ordinary world before the inciting incident it happens at the end of the chapter when Kato's broken out of prison. So, my tip is with that is if you're going to do that, kind of put the inciting incident before the ordinary world. Tip one, put a little bit of the ordinary world before the inciting incident, even in the first chapter. Tip two, you can break up the inciting incident. You can break up certain elements so you have like the parts of the inciting incident in the beginning and then other parts in the end. So with this book, for example, in the first chapter, in the inciting incident, you have the what? The jailbreak, the when, uh, in the future, the where, on the moon, by the prison, um, the who, you know Lacey Simmons is involved somehow, and the how, violence. But you know what you don't have? You don't get into the fourth chapter, the why. You don't know why Kyle has been broken out of prison. You don't know why these people killed everybody else just to save Kyle. You have no clue what's going on. And so that is the thing that I'm hoping keeps the reader interested up until the fourth chapter to get the why. Because the why typically is the most consequential question to leave unanswered in storytelling. And I say that because I was having a conversation with some professors about what's the difference between commercial, uh, was it commercial fiction and literary fiction? Commercial fiction is fiction that just sells, uh, whether it's Hunger Games, Harry Potter, stuff that makes money. Literary fiction, I guess, is considered more artistic. And nobody has a clear definition of like what one is versus the other, but one, one professor said something interesting. She said, what she's heard is commercial fiction is typically about what happens next. And then what happens after that, what happens after that, what happens after that. Literary fiction is about why what happens next happens next. If anything really happens at all, it's really just about the why behind the events in the story. The why has this elevating, humanistic, kind of satisfying um, quality to it. Like We want to know why things are happening. We want to know why I'm doing this video right now, right? The why. So the why does not get revealed in the first chapter. The why gets revealed, as far as the inciting incident is evolved, it's revealed in the fourth and fifth chapter, which is typically where you would have your inciting incident after building up the world, maybe the third chapter. But that was a little hard for me to do with this particular story. Um, so yeah, that's just my tip. If you're gonna do your inciting incident really early on, you can do, I was just the what, where, when, how. Leave the why for later to keep your audience engaged because they're gonna know why the hell did this crazy thing that happened for early pages happen. All right, I'm out. Deuces.